So welcome everybody. I'm Alex Barrett with Longview Forest and um, Mary is here as well and looks like Phil is going to join from the waiting room. Um, so welcome to the, the second uh, community workshop session. We're really excited everybody is here. Um, I will give kind of an overview of what the night's going to look like, but the, the main goal for tonight is to define a set of sustainable forestry practices uh, to include in these plans. We've had the drafts up for a little bit now, and hopefully people have had a chance to uh, review them. We'll go through them again tonight, but it'll be a pretty quick review. Um, the general agenda is a little bit of introduction, which I'll do here. Um, Mary's gonna lead us on a review and comment session with the different practices. And the main focus of that is gonna be questions and also a, a go around everybody who would like to speak um, to get a little public input and just have everybody voice their ideas and opinions. Um, and we'll do, we'll further our poll, uh, our technology here by doing a little live polling during the middle of it, just to get people's sense of, of what they're into. Um, we'll do Fournier first and then the town farm. And we'll have some discussion at the end of each section. Um, you know, there are basically 10 practices for each uh, forest and we'll see what we think about them or also solicit input if people have things that are not on those lists that they would like to discuss too. Um, so by way of introduction, um, you know, we what started out as a two month project, which was gonna be quite ambitious has turned into a six month project, which is really wonderful. And you know, we began with a lot of a uh, huge survey that had almost 90 people uh, give their opinions, which was just blew us out of the water. It was wonderful. We've had a few different meetings with the select board. Um, we've done a bunch of field work. Uh, Mary particularly has handled uh, countless emails and telephone calls, which have been great community input. And it's been, for me, it's been really wonderful watching her, you know, use all the amazing connections that, that you have, Mary, to just build a really great consensus here. Um, and, you know, now we're in the second workshop phase. Um, and that's going to be tonight where we're hoping to get a lot of good input from everybody here. Um, and then from there, um, we will finalize these drafts, you know, cross all the T's and dot all the I's and uh, go from there. And, you know, we're looking, these have to be in by September 30th. Um, we're hoping to do it a little bit earlier than that, um, but you know we'll be uh, working with the the feedback and comments that'll that'll hopefully come in after this meeting to sort of incorporate and refine and make make the plans uh, even better than what they are now. Um, the general kind of rules for the evening. Um, people are already awesome at this, so keep yourselves muted, please. But if you have something to say, we're a small enough group that you can unmute yourself and chime right in. Um, I'll try to sort of moderate uh, as best I can and call on people. Um, but also, you know, people are familiar with the chat function. If you have something that you want to say and the moment's not right, enter it in the chat function and then we'll have it there. It'll be recorded. Um, and then we can also sort of curate some questions out of that. Um, so, and like I said early on, we are uh, recording this, so anybody can uh, go look at it later, uh, including us when we go to make sure that we're incorporating everything. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Mary. Okay, I had one comment in chat to remind people who are phoning in that you can mute your line by pushing star six. And we just wanted to remind you of that. So um, the... This slide four, it just describes our process. The work we hope that you can complete tonight with us in this workshop. Um, we wanna do a go around where everyone has a chance to comment on the proposed sustainable forestry practices for your community forest. Um, Alex has a mechanism, raise hands and he'll like call you and then curate what your commentary. Um, if everyone could speak once before we let other people speak again and take two minutes or so. We're gonna present two questions about the proposed practices that you could comment on. And we're gonna also be conducting a, a inline a polling process on the Zoom platform that just asks you if you support a practice or not. And those results we're gonna to use to 
help define universal practices that everyone feels comfortable, including in the finished products and discerning ones that we need to discuss and have a, a further debate about. And so our discussion, discussion process of the workshop will be those practices that people have objections to or feel uncomfortable with so that we can um, try to form a consent about and compromise over what we should actually put in on your behalf in these management plans. From the beginning, we've been really clear on trying to articulate that we look at it one way, but these are not our treasures and we want you to tell us what to put in the plan. The proposal, the practices we proposed, we derive from your past comments. And so we'd like to be able to, after tonight, agree on a set of final SFPs, sustainable forestry practices for inclusion in your documents. And then we'll do at the end kind of a final check to make sure everybody's okay with what we're gonna put in, in the plan. Can you live with these practices? Should they show up in the um, management plan? And so um, next slide, please, Alex. Um, the pro what we, when you have your chance in the go round, we'd like you to consider two questions. And um, does this, does a, does a certain practice that we'll review have your support or at least your consent, like you could live with it happening out there? And your second question is, can you state in a, your concern or objection kind of in a concise and respectful way? And um, together we're hoping to agree upon the final set so we can complete the plans. So that's our work. And on the next slide, we're just wanting to have a definition out there to us what consent is going to mean is that we reach decisions about what to put in your plan for your community, um, a set of practices that our group can agree upon, that we can agree they're okay to be in there, maybe toss them out if there's objections, reasons to object. And to me, consent is a mindset. It's not that we're all going to agree. We have a diverse set of perspectives. We'd like to somehow integrate them together to have a path ahead so that we understand there won't be a hundred percent consensus. Not everybody's going to agree. It doesn't, it doesn't mean we want just unilateral support, but we'd like to have some reasons behind your objections. And then we can figure out what your, what your community can live with to include in your final document. And a quick review, slide seven, just, these are the goals that will be presented in the first section of the management plan. These were derived from our survey and our first workshop with you. The community showed up, it was an amazing response. And you articulated to us that you're interested in biodiversity, ecological services and benefits, that a forest ecosystem just provides by its natural process, which are social emotional goods, recreational opportunities, solace, the study of nature, um, water quality filtration, soil function and integrity, climate regulation, the forests are pooling car carbon all day when they're photosynthesizing. They are a recognizable tool in the scientific community for climate mitigation, economic goods. It is a timber asset. It does have value and cultural values. You have some historic features on these lands that are important to your towns, your community demonstrated that they're interested in sustaining forest resilience and promoting just the general health and productivity. And productivity, sort of divorcing it from an economic asset appreciation concept to just that they're healthy and they're able to perform and sustain the provision of those goods and services. So that's the broad outline of your goals. And now we'll go into each forest. Um, uh, one comment in the plan, we have a section on what this community-based process was. For us, it meant a whole different approach. Normally when I do for search of manager plans, I'm working with one owner and they state their goals and it's just, just one set of values. What we've tried to do here is communicate and educate your community, listen to you, include everyone's voice, balance each perspective. And we had to, um, meet and comply with the mandate of the Mohawk Trails Woodland Partnerships grant. And all together, we're trying to complete these plans for you. So we can start with the Fournier property. Um, I'm assuming that everyone's done a little bit of homework 
and review the sustainable practices that we've come up with. And we have a map here that is a rough sketch of where these practices may be implemented. And I'm gonna go through them somewhat quickly. So on the Fournier lot, the first practice we recommend is invasive plant control. You've got a really minimal community out there of invasive plants or in site specific areas. You can do the control manually with hand pulling, digging up roots of these plants. That's one practice. Second practice on Fournier is the creation of young forest openings. The last disturbance, it was a timber harvest, and then the tornado was, the timber harvest was 12, 13 years ago. So your youngest age group is 13 years now. Perhaps our recommendation is in seven more years, you make a small hole, it would not be commercial, it would be working with a natural opening to drop some trees just to introduce another patch of seedlings, youngest age class. That's the second practice we recommend at Fournier. The third practice for Fournier is there's some areas in the riparian zones that are minimally stuck, so you may consider planting some native shrubs in those areas and some of the upland drier sites also are minimally stocked on the forest floor so you could perhaps have a community project to plant shrubs there native plants fourth practice is your recreational goals it was overwhelmingly decided that your town loves to walk in these woods enjoys them it finds comfort out there the school uses it so you could um, continue maintenance of them, removing trees and debris when it falls in the path, maybe make a map of the trails and publish the map for placement in a kiosk or a box near the trailhead or available at town hall and develop a maintenance plan of keeping the path open. One idea was perhaps to create a loop to get you deeper into some of the sections that would create a figure eight through the woods and that is mapped on the proposed practice map to the right of the slide. And again, bearing in mind, if you're going into sensitive areas that natural heritage has defined as the home of rare and uncommon animals and plants, that we would observe a certain protocol there to be minimally intrusive. So the fifth practice at Fournier is the designation and setting aside of a forest reserve. Um, it's a practice known as proforestation, where you just let nature do its thing. We propose an area of up to 24 acres that includes um, the Hemlock Grove, the Vernal Pool and Wetland Complex that's all interconnected. And it, in some areas it runs consistent with what was protected by Natural Endangered Heritage Program during your last harvest disturbance. But also bear in mind that those areas will be protected anyways. There would be no disturbance there because that mandate from natural heritage is going to uphold through any future practice. So the sixth recommended practice at Fournier is educational outreach. Perhaps install some educational or interpretive signs at the vernal pool or at the trailhead that just describes some of the wonderful things out there, maybe state permitted uses in the area, maybe a sign at the ice pond to talk about the history, what was done in the old days there and maybe um, conducting some community hikes through the woods and certainly to continue in support the school's use of the forest as a forest classroom. So the seventh practice at Fournier is a silvicultural practice. Your last harvest disturbance was 13 years ago. So the trees are growing. We recommend a conservative crop tree release and crop tree to me doesn't mean necessarily your most valuable timber acid trees. It could mean uh, special habitat trees, maybe a white oak tree that's producing a white oak mast each year or a snag tree or your biggest trees, just uniquely maturing trees that you would considerably remove trees around them in order to improve their health and vigor. That's the seventh practice. Um, the eighth practice is something kind of healthy related where a lot of the commentary through the survey and feedback from the community was they felt when things were done in the past, there wasn't a consistent set of BMPs that synchronized well with your community values about the use of the forest. So maybe to document and codify a set of BMPs that 
would be there written down somewhere. So when an activity is proposed in the future, the community would have input to say, well, let's make sure we're, we're working with these BMPs. And in the plan itself, we present a appendix that discusses ecological forestry, which is a way to harvest that encompasses protecting and hey, I reluctantly say enhance, but at least protecting the way the forest works already. And um, that might be a really good idea. And in the vein of that, this is a time to just be, we recommend in the future, whenever something happens to have some process in works in your community where you have either a political body, a committee that's designated by your select board or an informal group, a, a forest stewardship team, a forest stewardship committee. So when an issue comes up, you have a mechanism in place to review, collect community import, import, um, input, and make decisions as, as a community before you actually implement and do anything out there. And the ninth practice is there's a lot of interest in the Commonwealth right now for using the forest as carbon sinks. The woods is storing carbon all on its own. It doesn't need us to mess around with it. It's just doing it. But there is some interest with your select board, with FERCOG, to um, formalize that and participate in a program that would sell carbon credits, or at the very least to maybe create in your BMPs a set of uh, an ideology around how to use the forest to mitigate climate. So we recommend that you explore that. And the final, the 10th recommendation for the Fournier lot is boundary delineation. The Fournier lot is well-defined in its perimeter with your neighbors with physical evidence of there's some signage on one neighbor to the east, barbed wire fences, some stonewall sections, but maybe to create, you know, a, a small kind of discreet community sign that lets hikers and certainly hunters on your neighbors know you are now entering town land. So there's a specific expectation of your behavior when you are here. So those are the 10 practices that we recommend for the Fournier property. And we'd like to now go into the go-round process. And again, I want to just review, each person gets a chance, try to be concise. Oh, before the go-round, we'd like to open it to questions about these 10 practices, specifically for Fournier. So Alex is going to take over and kind of run that piece. And sorry for the quick thing, they are here and the slides and we're hoping that you have them somewhere digitally in front of you to review with your questions. So thank you. Great, and I can also scroll back to anything if there's any just sort of clarity that's needed around anything there. But I think, you know, we're a, we only, there are 15 people here. So I think we'll be able to, um, you know, if you wanna use the raise your hand function, that will work. But I think you can also just chime in. We'll take maybe, three to five minutes here. So if people have any questions or, or just general clarifications before we get into the, the go around section, um, that would be good. And Alex, if I could just add, with the number we have tonight, we could go a little longer. This is your chance to, before you can decide if you support it or not, to ask us questions about what each of them mean or how they may look on the ground. Yeah, you wanna uh, go there, Priscilla? Uh, am I unmuted? Yes. You're okay. good. Oh, good. So I have a number of questions about the silver culture practice. And so um, in terms of the uh, choosing crop trees and uh, creating openings there, what kind of machinery would be used to do that? Would that require a fellow buncher? Uh, what kind of machinery? How would it disturb the soil? What would the carbon loss be there? Um, and why is that? recommended for 2025 um, and won't uh, if we do start uh, select cutting trees out in a selective process will that not lead to invasive species coming in you want to take it or you want me to go first alex um you can go first i have some ideas too okay so i'll take them each each part of your question so machinery this is where I suggest that the town, in your creation of those BMPs, if you look at models, Phil Cantor's asked me to provide him with some models of BMP, sets of BMPs, which I've been pulling together for him, 
because you can decide that you could have a limitation on tire pressure. You could have limitations on timing. I suggest on the Fournier, it's always winter logging, frozen ground or dry, snow cover preferably, and there, and you'd be minimizing the, the weight, the impact of the weight on the soils. Um, if you have winter logging, and so you're restricting it conditionally, thereby you'd be also minimizing disturbance to soil. And we have this discussion, and I think you were present, Priscilla, with the select board, and, and that's a matter of how you supervise and execute the project. If you're feeling uncomfortable with what's going on, the contract you draw up, if you're selling your timber asset, should include specifications on when to stop, who stops it, what, what the crew could actually do on the site, what kind of machinery they could use. I've often was taught a long time ago by old school lumber man that it's not the machine, but it's the operator. It's how this person is going to be running that equipment, if they're going to be following your protocol and guidelines, if they're going to be running a muck. Um, you can certainly restrict that size. That was, I think, beyond the scope of the plan itself. Um, we certainly can amend or append um, those sets of BMPs. I do recommend, I really like the idea of a forest stewardship committee in town because that's something they could review and have codified and documented. So when it is time to do something, you have a way to mandate what's going to go on. So that's A and B. Um, C was why the 2025 to 2027. Um, I've been working with CARED and climate mitigation a lot on my projects lately. And so I've been doing a lot of research into the, the, the most up-to-date science on how to work in the woods in order to protect that carbon cycle. And it suggests that if you disturb a woods, you give it a long period of recovery, a time for the, all of those ecological functions to come back to homeostasis, to recover their functionality back up to optimal. And they suggest a window of 20 years. Coincidentally, when I was in forestry school, that was also the window they recommended that we cut within. They call it a cutting cycle, period between disturbances to the, to the forest. So that's why I picked or, or made the recommendation for 25 to 27. That would be at the outside range of that 20 year recovery period. So do you have something to add, Alex? Yeah, I think the last, your last topic there, um, Priscilla, is the, was the question about invasive plants. And, you know, the, the cool thing about this property is that it has very little invasive plants on it, and we should try to keep it that way. The reality of the neighborhood level is that there are seed sources for these plants everywhere. You know, if you walk out there right now, you'll see some recent hemlock trees that blew over last winter, you know, that are making gaps. And so we, we you know, regardless of human intervention or not, uh, there is pressure from invasive plants here. And so the goal there is to A, get them out of the property itself, um, hopefully by having community engagement with the property on a, on a bigger level, educate neighbors about you know, dealing with their invasives as well. Um, but I, I view the invasive piece as mostly a question of you know, managing it over the very long term. I mostly think about it as um, you know, we keep a lot of lawns mowed, and if we stop mowing them, they turn into forests. Uh, in the case of invasives, if you stop paying attention to your woods, they creep in. And it's not, you don't have to mow it every week like your lawn, but you do have to keep after it. And it's if you value their absence. Um, so I think we have another minute here. I think Allison has a question next. Can I have one more thing, Alex? With the invasives, Priscilla, the, the level, the intensity of harvest is minimal and conservative, and shade is, is a really great deterrent from invasive plant community spread. So you wouldn't be letting in that much, a, a lot of light on the forest floor, and that deters their introduction or spread. So, and right, Allison, maybe, question? Yeah, let's go to Allison next. Okay, guys, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I'm really interested in integrating some more information um, about involving the school um, in long-term forestry education. And in particular, uh, especially if you go ahead and harvest some trees using you know, long-term civil cultural practices that somehow um 
there the school is involved initially um, but it goes into a long-term educational process so that as the years go on that they can monitor the changes um, that have been made that you have created so the whole idea of you know um, forestry and that you are creating a new um, I guess concept in the landscape something is happening out there and can the school be involved mathematically or biologically learning something in each area um, and each grade as you know has requirements that they need to meet for MCAS um, to meet state requirements and so that would be, take a little more focused approach um, it doesn't need to be in detail in the plan right now but I wonder if that's a good way to stay involved you know the whole idea of continuing to work with Conway and um, with the school right in the backyard um, as an educational you know background for them definitely when I when I was doing the inventory work I right at the end of the day I stumbled out of the forest and like basically tripped over a bunch of nets that some kids had been using to you know explore sure. something in the woods and oh goodness who's are these it was really cool um, right but I think I also think that the context of our current environment um, you know I'm dealing with a project in, in Vermont right now where a school has an exact analogy that has a forest exactly like this next to it and they were making outdoor classrooms for them out in the woods you know we're basically dealing with trees that are you know threatening different like sort of hazard tree removal type stuff um, because every, they're all mandated to be outside a lot more with the trying to reopen in the pandemic time here. So it's, people are thinking about it a lot. And I think the history of having already used that forest um, gives you a really strong platform to move it forward. Exactly. Um, okay, great. And I, I think to add, um, we did reach out to your principal. She's very interested in the process and how to keep the school involved. And one thing I think we could put in as a rec recommendation is for your school to explore a project learning tree or project wild where they, they have a system to integrate these concepts into your regular environmental science curriculum. I know teachers can get some of their annual credits for their licensing if they attend these workshops and maybe providing the principal with the um, necessary resources for her to explore that would be a good idea to include. What do you think, Allison? That sounds great. Um, I was actually thinking along the lines um, of permanent plots. So, Ooh, I mean, it's, a, idea, yeah. Yeah, it's where kids could go back and measure every year. Um, and sort of bring in the whole mathematical scientific concept. Um, I did work up in the town of Coleraine and the older grades really love to collect data um, and go within a plot, count trees, measure trees. Um, and how could we use that to educate um, students about, uh, you know, growing and harvesting trees for human use, you know, as a crop. Um, it won't happen all the time. It'd be very limited within this forest, but that's the idea that, you know, if, if the town decides to go ahead once this, this, in this next 10 year period, let's say that somehow that's documented, maybe videos are made and then each year kids go back and measure and, you know, the teachers actually learn as well and watch things grow. Um, and, and I think that would be a valuable tool for them all. I, I like awesome. that. I like that a lot. Thank you for that input. And I think and Mary, Mary has a question. Oh, Mary, Mary McClintock has her hand up. Um, two things. I love the idea of um, environmental ed with kids um, and using this and it's uh, with the school. It's um, one of the reasons I was so distressed about how the highway department is using the land um, between the school and the bulk of the woods is that I'm, you know, was concerned about the kids access. And right now, having just been out there and walked around and seen the sprawl of the highway department's use of the property, I don't understand how you could safely get children from the school to the uh, woods 
while during a, a school day when the highway department was working there. It is, um, it, it, there's just, there's, there is no safe way to move um, children in a group um, from point A to point B. So, and that brings up for me the part of thinking about this property is that we not only have a school next to it, we have a huge highway department complex next to it and next to the woods and what the impact of that is and how we pay attention to that. And I would want any kind of sort of plan for this to, to be looking at how to contain and mitigate the impact of that highway department use. I mean, if you look at the Biomap 2 um, that's in the draft report, you'll see that there is part of the area of con conservation concern is right where they're dumping large, huge piles of gravel right now. So I think that somehow we can't have the highway department just doing their thing and think the forest and the school, you know, like there's three there's three major uses of that property, the school, the highway, and the forest. And we need to, those need to be all talked about and integrated and attended to. And at this point, my sense is that the highway department has given, been given free reign over a huge area. I'm also somewhat puzzled by the map of the Fournier property because it does not include the two acre section that was added by, um, uh, um, Lillian Boyden's donation in 1990 or the four acres that we bought from Gary Leshevsky in um, uh, I think around 2006 and that um, it doesn't include those that that six acres and that's part of that complex so I don't I'm not quite sure how I mean it's an old line that map that it appears to me not, to not have the little divot out of those things. So there were that. Um, the other thought I had is, is in terms of the educational component, if you could safely teleport the children to the woods over the, you know, with, if there's like a skyway to get them there across the highway garage area, um, that I don't know that you have to have silviculture practices to do what Allison is talking about. If you really want to teach about silviculture, then you can do that. But they could start yesterday um, with that kind of looking at plots. How do they change over time? Um, my first career was environmental education and outdoor leadership. And I could think of right off without even thinking, I could think of a dozen lesson plans right now that could use that forest and over time that you know, it doesn't require any additional, you know, matter what happens um, in terms of silviculture. I really, I'm curious about why create young forest patches? That was one that, you know, I have to, I have to state a bias. My preference would be to leave the whole thing the way it is, not do any further cutting of any kind and let it just do its thing. That's absolutely my bias. Um, I could consent to create young forest patches and silviculture if there was a really serious mechanism for community input and for those best management practices that we're talking about so that it wasn't a situation and again where there's really good supervision having had recent you know having had experiences of the guy in the bulldozer doesn't know doesn't really go get the plan or doesn't buy into the plan or doesn't understand the plan and all it takes is one guy in a bulldozer or one guy in a big piece of heavy equipment to mess something up that wasn't in the plan if there isn't good supervision. So I would be really concerned about having strong language in any silviculture practice or create young forest sections about that they were based on best management practices that was agreed on by the community with a really clear plan of how they were going to be supervised. I, I, Thank you, Mary. Um, I agree, Mary. <laughs> we, we've sort of uh, 
I think this is great. We're sort of, I'm just kind of letting things roll and not being a super rigid uh, moderator here, but it's really good. So let's just keep going and we're- Well, we're sort we've of, sort of entered the discussion phase. Yeah, we're into it. <laughs> so does it, you know, I can, I can either sort of call on people or do, do other people have uh, questions or maybe, thoughts about Maybe anything? open the poll so we can see what people already consent to as far as the practice goes. Um, um, to address what Mary said, I think, this whole process to me has really made me understand that your community cares about these forests. They might not, I mean, they don't know how to articulate it or maybe not everyone's as vocal as everyone else, but the, the crafting of BMPs that you somehow document and archive that are specific to your town forest is important and the creation of some sort of body who holds responsibility holds accountability for the care and stewardship of these lands. I think those, if you had such a mechanism in place, then your concerns and objections you have voiced to just now, I think would be addressed there. I'm not sure that may be a way to resolve your objection. What do you think? Uh, Bob, do you want to chime in? Sure. Um, uh, in, in a, I have a couple thoughts, but in a very overall sense, you know, we did start this process hoping that you guys would listen to the the needs of our, the wishes of our town. You know, that our select board does not have a dog in this fight. We, we, we aren't looking to make profit from these forests and we want the management of the forest to be what the people of Conway want. And I believe you guys have done a great job of listening to the folks of Conway Thank and you. are trying to reflect that. And I just really, I wanted to just say I appreciate that. And as far as I can tell, I do think people believe they are being heard. So this awesome. is great. Thank you. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, so, but one of the things that you didn't mention that has come up a couple times, and it relates so much to what Mary just said, is that our town forests exist in a location surrounded by other forests that are being managed differently than the way we manage our forests. And those forests are clearly doing cutting and creating these open areas. And I'll say providing the kinds of things that you're talking about as being good for forestry practices. And perhaps we don't need to have those things performed by our forests because they are living in this world where we're surrounded by forests that are being logged, for example. And so, so that we don't need to provide open areas in our forests in order to meet that perhaps laudable goal. So anyway, it, when, when, so when Mary, and so I do get the opinion that, that we really should be justifying heavily any tree that we need to cut down. Not that we should never cut down a tree, but we really need a real justification of why that tree had to get cut. Because there are plenty of other trees that are being cut. So that's, that's my comment on what Mary was just saying. Okay, so you, your objection is based on a landscape perspective where you believe there's a lot of extraction going on locally and perhaps the economic goods that flow out of West County out of Conway are coming from other lands state forest, coals, private. So um, how I'm seeing a resolution to your objection is maybe you have, um, if silviculture is used, there has to be a specific reason, a hazard tree, the adelgia takes off, things are dying at an alarming rate. And so perhaps it could be included in an SFP that's contingent upon future reviews, that adaptive management process where you're constantly monitoring and making new decisions if the circumstances and the forest condition changes. Is that kind of- You say it so much better than I ever can. Yes. 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 Okay. You say it better than I can. That's great. All right. Yeah, and, and Bob, just to, to piggyback on what Mary's saying, I think, you know, the, you're, you're right on the landscape level. It, it, that's a really good perspective to have. Um, you know, however, there are vulnerabilities at the individual tree level to all sorts of things. And we're, you know, people have spoken loudly and clearly about carbon and having a dynamic carbon balance in the forest. And, you know, we're, we're trying to kind of pull all those pieces together on a, 
you know, on an individual tree level and then on a six square mile level. Um, and so it's, it's definitely a balancing act. Um, and, you know, I think getting, getting this kind of framework like Mary, what you're describing is exactly what people are saying they want to have out there. Um, Susan, I think you had a question. Yes. Yeah, not, uh, well, I want to, um, okay. So I, I, I live, some of my land borders, Johnny Bean Road and I'm on Maggie Bean Drive. And, um, first of all, are we just talking about Fournier property right now? Or is this a general right. discussion about we'll the town farm next, Susan? Okay. So, um, I want to say that I agree with much of what Mary said, uh, right on. And also with what Bob said that, that, um, I don't, I mean, I'm not big on wanting to do logging. We had the tornado, which totally wiped out part of Herrick Gulf and it is growing back a wonderful bird sanctuary that's very close to the old town farm. So we, I agree with what was said. And frankly, if I were a tree, I'd like to be allowed to live my life out. And I think that's true. And I think we can smile and joke about it. But in, on page 31, you've written, there is much we don't know. And that is true. The complexity of the forest life is so beyond our comprehension. And when we disturb, we disturb. And we don't have a clue how much, how much death and um, destruction. And as you said, it takes, what, 20 years? And then I can't believe they say you can start the cycle again. Um, having yeah. So anyway, I just really, I'll talk later when we get into the old farm, um, town farm, but I just want to support what Mary and Bob said. I think that that's right on. Yes. Awesome. We're, we're doing really well time-wise here. Thank you, Susan. Um, I think, does anybody else have anything that they'd like to say about the Fournier? And then we'll, we'll do like a one or two minute, uh, whole interlude here and then we'll, we'll have a little bit more discussion after that. We'll, we'll share the results so everybody can see what everyone else is thinking and then go from there. Great, I was hoping to hear from Jack. So here he is raising his hand. Okay. Great. Can you, am, am I on? You're on. Okay, good. Um, I've been wandering around the forest next door to the Fournier Forest and also in the Fournier Forest for about 50 years now. Uh, and something I've noticed that has really changed in the last two or three years, particularly, I haven't noticed it in the Fournier Forest, but I have noticed it in our forest and in Dean Rankin's forest, there's been a huge increase in the amount of bittersweet that is starting. And on some of our land where we've let bittersweet go, it just grows to the point where it smothers the tree and it actually kills them. So I think unless there is an active plan to control the bittersweet, you can forget the trees because they're all gonna die. The, this bittersweet is, I think it's related to global warming. It's, it's really coming on strong. It's something that's happening in the last three or four years particularly. Uh, and we, we've really gotta be actively going after that um, if we want to preserve the trees. So that means there's going to have to be some kind of active management in there, or it's, it's going to look like some of the southern forests where the kudzu has just sort of taken over everything and uh, everything gets smothered with it. Yeah, and the, the small amount of bittersweet that's on the property now is sort of in the southwest quadrant on the sort of hillside above the well there moving over toward the farm there where they have some there's a little sort of pig area right next to the property and like that's where I've seen it and it's you could certainly cut it down repeatedly right now or rip it out repeatedly it's not uh jumping tree to tree and being a disaster that right, right there quite yet right so yeah you're, you're spot but, on but and, um I mean, my experience is you can try to pull it by hand but um, it just comes back unless you're in there every year pulling with a significant labor force. Um, the, you're, you're not going to stay ahead of it. 
um, it it really does get very difficult. So I, I think that's got to be watched carefully and s significant resources have to be applied to it. Uh, it's been springing up sporadically in the rest of the forest and on Dean Rankin's land and on our land, sometimes in the middle of areas that you just wouldn't expect it to be there at all. But it, I agree. I've seen that. Keep your eyes out. So I think um, I'm hearing agreement universally that invasive control should be a SFP that's in your plan. And I think it, maybe we didn't spell it out, but we can revise the plan to say that your control program should be ongoing. It should be renewed annually to see if you need more input. Um, if you synchronize invasive control with no cutting, so the shade level stays the same there, that would be helpful. But uh, yeah, I do agree. And I, I think we've put that in the plan thus far. And uh, so we have agreement on that one. <laughs> I do have um, a comment to make if I could mm -hmm. right now, um, or just a little input. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about is uh, resilience. And I think because there is a lot of interest in carbon and climate, um, I think it's important to take a look at areas that were harvested before the tornado, where tree regeneration was established and to go see you know what resilience means and you know i've had umass students out in the woods to look at abutting properties um where active management has been ongoing for maybe 30 years right mary um and had students say wow i finally understand after four years of college what everybody's been talking about because when the storm comes through and blows down trees or ice storms come through and treetops are blown out that there is an understory of trees that have been established waiting to spring in, up into the sunlight and hold that forest intact um, it won't take years for a forest to get reestablished as it would if it weren't managed. And so I'm not saying that every acre needs to be managed, but I do see great benefits in solid, responsible forest management. Um, it has to be done well and planned out by a responsible forester and then carried out as well by a very good logger where there's oversight. But we can see this behind the school on the Fournier property. And we can see this over on the town farm lot. Um, so I just wanna put that out there as we're talking about what the town would like to see. Um, and while we're concerned about carbon, um, that resilience is just as important. Um, and while we're actually talking about invasives as well, because if you have an established understory that established seedling bank that's already there and sapling bank will take off and hopefully hold back some of these invasive seedlings, you know, that we'll still need to chase down for sure. But I, I don't think it's all, it's not all lost. Um, I think we can grow trees and, and trees will outgrow the invasives. Okay. So did you do the poll out? Do we have like nope. a response on? Maybe, maybe we'll take one last question from Phil and then we'll go to the oh, poll. Good. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Al. So for, um, the first thing I'd just like to say is that, you know, the, the, the work product that you're showing tonight is the result of an agreement of a contract with the town and the, you, you fulfilling the obligations of a grant. Um, so that's why it's structured and it looks the way it does. Um, and I would also like to say that, that to date you, Alex, Mary, you have done every single thing you said you were going to do in a timely and professional manner. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, I think the work product that you generated is um, reflective of, of having listened to the town so far. Um, and yeah, my, my personal 
biased towards this is not really even to, and, and I'll say this now because the same comments would apply towards the, the, the other town forest as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is that, you know, my, my personal interest is the carbon sequestration angle. And that what, what a lot of people in this meeting probably don't know is that I, I wrote a grant the, on behalf of the select board um, for the next round of, M, uh, of Mohawk Trail Woodland Partnership grants for a, a $20,000 feasibility study uh, to determine Conway's eligibility to participate in the carbon credit market um, in the project out of Williamstown and Williams College. And um, so, so, and as near as I can tell, the, there's some element of all of the above as the best strategy for carbon sequestration, some mixture of all of the above. Um, and so, so that, that's my uh, bias towards it. But that, and that's my hope that in the future that we can look towards um, the carbon credit market as a source of revenue in our town. Um, so that's, that, that's my, uh, and, and I, I think that, um, I think that you've understood that so far and the, your work product shows it, so. Thank you. We tried, we tried to listen. Um, okay, so. All right, let's, let's, let's jump into the, the, new, the new environment here and try a poll. So okay. the, I'm gonna put up a, a poll that everybody will be able to look at. And the idea here is that it's a multiple choice thing and you can click as many as you would like. Um, and there are sort of three criteria, you know, one is, is this something you really support? Two, is, and this is all spelled out in the questions, so you'll see it, but it's good to hear it twice. Two is, you know, is this something that you could consent to see happening? Like Mary put it really clearly, like Mary McClintock, you know, not really into this idea, but like if it's done really well, I'd, I'd be okay with a little bit of this here and there. And then the third sort of criteria is, you know, is this something that you would be willing to fully compromise on because you would it would it would bring more people into the tent um, and you know that may or may not apply to some of these practices but I'm going to share that that's all written to the top of them anyway uh, but we'll take maybe a minute or two here and see how it goes um, well, so ho hopefully this works so can everybody see the results now Awesome. So red, red is not actually bad. It just means it got all the way there. So, you know, nine, nine different people uh, gave responses here. So um, what Mary's in my plan right now was just to quickly read through them carefully and just sort of see what did well and what didn't do well. And, you know, uh, it looks like everybody voted a lot. So that's good. Um, but I think just to we were commenting earlier as we were preparing that you know, in a if this was a workshop in a town hall, we would we would have two minutes of quiet while we all read things. But the pressure of online makes you feel like you need to be talking all the time, um, but you don't. So, is this a tool you guys have, or is this built into Zoom, or how? You know, this is this is great. That, Isn't it cool? I've I've never used it that, before, but it's it's built into Zoom. Um, I used to teach in school. I would have loved to have been able to. Had the kids, you know, evaluate their their answers, you know, in class, something like this. Yeah, and I've seen it done at various conferences and things, and you can very quickly get a, a sense of whether people are hearing what you're saying or not. Um, hmm. So, um, Mary, do you have what you what you need here to talk a little I bit about so. this? I think so. Our goal with this integration is to decide. Definitely SFPs you can include, those that we have objections and concerns about that may need more discussion. So I can safely say invasive species control, put it in. Um, trail development, mapping, signage, put it in. Reserve designation goes in the plan. Um, I think 78% with carbon, I would say put that in the plan and that would help you position you to participate in those additional um, programs that your select board is now investigating. Let's see, we've got the BMPs at 56%. I think that's, you know, that's, that's not high, but I, I think it's important. I, maybe we can start a discussion around there. My preference would be to include that. It, it is a lot of work. I think one avenue you could 
explore is now that you have a forest stewardship plan, you're eligible to apply to the DCR runs a community um, grant program. And maybe you could get funding to um, do a process similar to this to craft those BMPs. Because even trail development, you may just want a protocol, a guide on how to work on these lands. That's what I think about the BMPs ones. I'm open to hear other people's opinions and concerns because this one would apply to both properties. So we're sort of doing the work for both right now. So if anyone wants to raise their hand and add their feedback. Yeah, Phil. So I, um, I thought that I was surprised the BMP clause didn't get more votes. Um, the, so the and and I'll speak on behalf of the BMP as well because I thought that it was a significant it's a significant opportunity especially if we're going to form some sort of committee or other type of gr a grouping of people that care about this issue that want to keep their fingers in this issue um, and that uh, it's the rules of the road would be a good thing to establish for our use for as a town as a community of the the, the property that's jointly held for all of us and. Um, and that's what the BMP is, and it's uh, just, I, I, I guess, it probably got passed over because it's kind of droll looking and boring, best management practices, eh, yeah. you know, but, but, uh, but it, I, I think it's pretty important. So I, I, I but it's only, if it only five votes or whatever, I don't, I don't know. And I we're not, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not doing, uh, we're not doing majority uh, dictatorship here. So this is mostly yeah. just to, to gauge. People. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just one vote. But. And not to make someone uncomfortable, but if we could maybe hear from someone who has a concern to not put resources and energy to that practice so that we could see, are you willing to move to middle ground to compromise with that practice or not? If we could talk a little bit about your concern and objection. And if you don't feel comfortable, I get it. Or is it one of those ones that um okay janet puts a vote for good idea is it one of those ones you're willing to accept and live with like you could get along with it you consent to it but maybe not love it could we put it in that category so it could be included so well who's objecting well <laughs> that feels weird so we shouldn't really you know I mean, don't I made know. The come on <laughs> <laughs> Must be cool. Or why? Why? Nobody didn't vote for it, right? Okay, Priscilla. Oh, you're muted, muted, Priscilla. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, there you go. Cool. I didn't vote on it because I didn't see it. I didn't realize the questions went down further. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. got it. <laughs> I'm not sure how I feel about it because. Um, I know that um, from my experience, and I don't mean to offend anyone who does, and I know there are people here who do work for DCR, um, my experience with them in their um, public force and their best management practices is um, really concerning. And so I don't know how much influence into best practices would come from there and how much it would, I think we would, those making those best practices, developing those really would need to do a lot of educational um, research and understanding to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Priscilla, if I, if I could say, you know, I think the, what we were thinking there is that, you know, there's, there's the law and sort of the, the common practice of the land, which is obviously applicable to everybody because we're all citizens here and the idea is that Conway might want to do something above and beyond that. And that seems like a pretty reasonable thing here. And, you know, we, the main, one of the main pieces that we heard about process, you know, BMPs are usually about ruts and culverts and this kind of stuff. But one of the main things we've heard is that people would really like a process of inclusion and in decision making. And that could be part of sort of the, you know, that the best management practices include talking to the community about these things. Bob, you want to go? So one of the things that I just heard from Priscilla was she, she saw all the ones at the top of the form and didn't scroll down and didn't see the ones in the bottom of the form. And yep. the ones in the bottom of the form are definitely all voted nowhere near as heavily. 
So I'm wondering, could we give everybody a couple minutes to scroll down and check their votes for the ones in the bottom of the form? And I mean, reopen the pool. The pool. Reopen uh, the pool, even for two minutes. I mean, yeah. you know, it would not take long. So but if if you, it would make it then a real survey. People. I mean, I almost said, I wonder where all of the other ones are, and then I noticed the scroll bar. Okay. okay well, yeah. I will. Uh, okay. I will it. relaunch the poll, and you've all seen them many times. So I think you might have to vote again for all the ones again, but we'll just see how it goes. We we have a good sense for things, but I'll, I'll relaunch it right now. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Oh, great. We'll just get to do it. Okay. So there are ten questions. Just so. We have better participation already, so this is good. Right. Yeah, so the next time we, any of us tries using polls in a Zoom meeting, remind people to scroll down or yeah. tell them how many questions there are. Check them all out. Um, all right. Part, uh, of our, think, part of our learning curve. I love this poll function, though. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end it again. Um, and yeah, I think Mary, maybe let's let's sort of wrap up with kind of the the bottom end ones here, which are yep, you know, Crabtree release and Young Forest. Yep. Yeah, I think everything else we could include. Um, I think we've heard some of the objections and concerns around the harvest disturbance and uh, patch opening creation. If people have more to add on that, our, our process here is to decide if we can include it, if there's a way you could live with that as a, a practice that is included in your community for stewardship plan. And um, I think I'm gonna take, I have the platform, I'm gonna take it. Could it be included? If the caveat is there that you have a validation and peer-reviewed science behind using silviculture to promote and enhance forest resiliency, and the science that is known now suggests a balance when you are using the forest as a carbon pool between accumulation of carbon in young trees, storage in older. So if you can establish and validate in your planning process that a, a timber disturbance, harvest, however you want to call it, silviculture, we like that kind word, is going to promote resiliency and enhance the forest capacity to, to um, act as climate mitigation tool. Could we reach a consent on that? That's my opinion. And I open it for discussion because these two show up again in Town Farm. So we're sort of doing the next work also while we're at it. I have a feeling many of the practices are the same on Town Farm. We may get the same poll. So it, I think the time now is warranted to delve a little deeper into these two. So I open the floor. Can I speak? Yes. Oh, yes. Go, go ahead, Janet. Uh, it just seems to me that having diverse age groups in any forest um, is helpful in the long term to the health of the forest. Uh, you know, we can't, hopefully we're not going to have another tornado to take some out. And so, um, you know, if you carefully, carefully controlling and we have a committee and, you know, we have the science, um, you know, without, without other disturbances, how are we going to get some diverse ages and maybe even, you know, different species if, you know, the ash trees get, and, and particularly when the uh, hemlocks, you know, if the adelgid takes those out and, and some of their others, I mean, uh, so that's my concern. And um, I think it's very important. Thank you. Yeah, Priscilla. Priscilla. So I would say that there is, it, my greatest concern is the climate emergency and the work that the forests can do for us in that. Um, and I think that's the most immediate concern for myself. And 
daily there is more and more literature coming out saying that the best thing to do for our climate is to leave our forests alone. So I think, you know, that's really important to me. And I think that um, we need to really have that information and look at that information and have that um, very clearly part of our assessment as to what we want to do in the force. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know your first name, but Mr. Strzgowski? Joe. Joe. I'm trying to unmute. I'm trying to unmute you. There you go. Perfect. Uh, Jack wrote an article, but and I think there's been some in the mass wildlife. But one of the issues with this carbon thing is the the rate that the carbon is stored at and the capacity of the forest. And I think there's a, an old dead tree doesn't absorb any more carbon, but it has carbon stored in it. So if you were to cut it down and build a house out of it, it it's still sequestered but it's serving a different purpose. Um, so, I, and I know Jack may be better at explaining this than I, I've thought about it, but I haven't got a, a good explanation there. A younger tree, or there's a period in the life of a tree when it absorbs more carbon than it does when it's mature, a mature tree. So I don't think you can just say you need to leave old trees or you need to have all young trees. It sort of goes back to that there needs to be a mixture, I think. There needs to be trees that are absorbing and those that have absorbed and are storing it. And, and there are different discussions. And Priscilla, and I don't really know how we're going to get a consensus on this, because if you're in the rate side, you want one thing. And if you're in the volume side, you want something else. Um, I was a selectman for 24 years, and these decisions were made at town meeting with a majority vote. And is that where we go with this? Or, or we are, we're never going to get to a consensus. Priscilla and I will never agree, I think, on what's the best thing to do. I, I like Jack, I have 20 acres land. I did a five acre patch cut. Uh, Allison was, you know, helped me out with that. Uh, I was interested in wildlife. I'm still interested in carbon and all those kinds of things. But, um, it's just a totally different perspective on what's right for the world. You know? Yeah, and what's what's been a really cool piece of this process is just you know, putting it on a map and saying like, whoa, should we put half the property into a reserve area and then, you know, delicately manage the other part of it? Is that acceptable? Like, you know, we probably can't have our cake and exactly eat it too, but we're, we're trying to get close. Mary, do you want to McClintock? Um, could we, could we agree <laughs> in our group process tonight that, um, well, we got two choices, include it or not. If we include it, could we agree that it's phrased with contingency? The, I mean, it's in the future anyways. Um, there was a comment about that we don't recommend a forestry committee. We do in another part of the plan. I can revise that BMP part to include a forestry committee recommendation so that it's in, in the actual stewardship practice list. I agree that was an oversight. And can we agree that with the contingency that your forestry committee reviews it, there's a mechanism for consensus. You review the science and the, the current awareness of what a for, how a force functions when you're in that time of deciding how and what to harvest. And if we use language that states the things we have just talked about, where it's not set in stone, you're not gonna cut 100,000 board feet or 50 cords, but you're going to review to see where the science is at time the condition at the time, five years out is five years out, things could change a lot in five years. And we, could we agree as a group to include a silvicultural practice, not naming it, not quantifying volume, but saying, if it's useful for forest resilience and uses of the forest ecosystem as a carbon sink and a climate mitigation tool, that the town will form consensus around the execution of a silvicultural operation. And that way you leave it open for that adaptive mechanism that you review it, you look at it, maybe the, another tornado comes or your neighbors cut heavily, circumstances change, but you have left yourself open to doing something. And uh, 
that the town has the control over what is done. Is that something we could agree out to, to include in the plan? That's one path I see to a common resolution. Any input? Um, I, thank you. Um, first of all, if we're talking about the Fourniers, it's 45 acres, right? Correct. 45 acres is not that much land. Yeah. And if we're gonna put in a figure eight type trail, and if our primary goal for the people is a, a sanctuary, a place to go and just, you know, do what they say in Japanese, forest bathing. If we find a, a plot, an area that we're going to be cutting, it makes a dramatically different experience for the person. So I think just thinking about the sides, it's not that big. So I think I, I'm, I'm going to have problems with having any kind of uh, tree cutting in that space. So are we as a group deciding we, we can't come to a, a live with the acceptance of any kind of harvesting on the 40 year piece through the future? Is that the way the group is leaning? Well, your plan. I, I'm not attached to know, either outcome. I'm playing devil's advocate just so every voice is heard. That's the only reason, honestly. We, we still have 50% here. So, you know, yeah. it has, it's, it's divided. I wouldn't say there's a consensus to take yeah. it out. You know, I, um, Could we guys, do it with that contingency language in the, the, the structure plan? Well, certainly, I mean, so the, it, the plan, the plan is a, is a plan, uh, you know, it can be revised. It, you know, yeah. could, if it's not in there, you know, some of the future committee can make a case and maybe, yeah you know, it'll be added later. I don't, I mean, we're not like voting now. This is the well, permanent decision. No, and that's why we included several paragraphs on adaptive management. As conditions change, science changes, the community changes, you may change your mind. And an adaptive management plan allows you to revise right. if you right. necessary. Right, so I'm gonna agree with Janet, um, if you guys can hear me. Um, and I'm going to suggest that in the plan, you do include um, suggested or optional practices so that you don't have to amend the plan later if one of the practices suits. Good idea. Suits the time period, five years out, six years out, or whatever, if the hemlock, you know, is actually hit by the scale and not the adulted, that it it's dying very quickly and you need to operate very quickly because then you're uh, amending your management plan and all that. But if it's in there and you're ready to yeah. respond, you're ready to respond, um, which is, which is the purpose of the plan. Um, so, I mean, you have options, all of that. And the other thing, um, sort of speaking as a town taxpayer myself, um, I don't see how such a small group could make a decision tonight for the entire town. So I'm going to, I'm going to agree with Joe, um, that, you know, we need a larger poll out there. We need a larger subset of people voting from the town about what, you know, how they would like to see the forest, use like so you know i i often use an analogy um of a landscape design you know you're you move into a house and you know you don't have gardens and you really would like some gardens but you have to hire a landscape designer and they're going to come in and create a new landscape for you based on your goals and so we as a group as a town should be finding some way to decide what our goals are for this forest and why does it need to change? Do we need to change the forest or do we have to be ready to respond to climate or to insects, to disease? And, you know, what should be in the plan, you know, should those things happen? So, you know, that's, that's sort of the idea that I would use, you know, when approaching the management plan and the use of these properties. We know people are recreating out there. We know people are interested in climate. We know, I know lots of people in town who are interested in wildlife and forestry practices, creating wildlife habitats so they can go hunting. 
Um, so there's a lot of different uses out there. And, and mm -hmm. um, I think it would be interesting to get more feedback from, you know, the entire town. Um, could I add something? I like your concept of, could we agree as a group that um, civil culture is added as an optional practice in the future when a consensus is formed around it? It's not committing you to anything. It's leaving it open as a viable tool if it's going to serve your goals and the goals of the ecosystem functionality itself. Could we agree to put it in that way? I mean, something like the invasive control, your BMPs, what was the other thing that's solid? The, the reserve, reserve area. Those, those are givens. Those will be in the plan, implementable, picking grants right now. Civil culture is an optional idea that needs further exploration and a mechanism for definitive consensus in the future. Can we agree to include it that way? That sounds like a good, a good compromise. And, yeah. and Allison made a really good point that if it's not in there now as a potential possibility, then apparently you've got to amend the whole plan, which is cumbersome. Yeah, Mary McClintock? Uh, you know, perhaps what we could do is make one of these 10 things be the, the establishment of the committee yes, that has the opportunity to, and that, you know, is, is really tasked with community input on decision making, you know, on specific things and that they could and that, you know, that the different practices that are named and other possible practices, you know, I don't know if there's a way to say in a plan, the sort of little weasel words ones that is, you know, or other practices or something. Um, yeah. I would be okay. I, you know, the thing that really matters to me, one of the things that really matters to me is the kind of input like that we're having in this thing. And I don't, you know, as much as Bob and Phil and Erica are fabulous select board members or town meeting is fabulous or whatever. I think having a committee of folks who are really focused on this and who can, you know, get the kind of community input um, is crucial if what we're talking about, you know, because we, if we make a plan right now, we don't have something like that. Five years from now, there's a whole different set of select board members. Other, you know, we're not, people aren't paying attention. And they go, oh, it says right here in the plan, uh, like in 2000, you know, this time we're supposed to do this thing, oh, we're doing this thing. And it's like, no, we are reviewing whether that's a good idea to do that at that point. I see everyone like shaking heads. I think we have an approach. We have a path to completion of the 40 year forest stewardship management plan, create a, a whole new SFP practice seven that states the town will formally um, engage and activate a decision making body, a forest stewardship committee, town forest stewardship committee, whatever you want to call it, that takes on accountability or responsibility for these decisions and the community involvement down the road before something is done. And we place beneath um, the set practices some optional ideas that may help you reach your goals that are not set in stone. Is, can we agree on that group? Joe? Awesome. Um, yeah. oh, awesome. We're, okay, we did we're, it. We're doing, uh, we're, we're a little bit behind on schedule, but um, this is exactly what it should be. So I'm not worried about it. Yeah. Um, but we'll try to be respectful also of people's time because we're, we're coming up on, on nine o'clock here. Um, so if you, if you leave because it's bedtime, um, we, we won't not like you. We'll just know that it's bedtime. Um, yeah, we'll understand. But we can go through town farm quick, do the poll. A lot of the issues I think are gonna be identical to Fournier. And I think we've already made the, the path to live with. We've already made a consent. Uh, should I just start Town Farm, Alex? Yep, I'm gonna, you can all see the screen now with Town Farm. Okay, Town Farm, we have the same kind of map that highlights where these areas might be. Um, if you read the plan, they describe each stand very well. We have 11 recommendations in Town Farm. First is the invasive plant control. Town Farm is a little differently. There is um, higher stocking of these invasive plants in the areas closest to Johnny Bean Road, um, the cemetery, the old 
that own the old stock pens that are, it's, if I had a simple metric of A is highest, C is lowest, I put them at B's plus. Um, I'd say half of it is Asiatic bittersweet. So you may have to entertain the use of chemicals up there, um, minimal use, stem specific in order to control those plants up on that hill. So that is one recommendation. Evasive control, different mechanism than Fournier. Two, again, is addressing your recreational needs, mapping the trails, creating a map that you use in town, can distribute through town hall, have it available online um, so that people can go and enjoy that. It connects to a broader system, more extensive system of the Conway State Forest. Currently the trails, when the harvest was done last time, the roads were opened up, they have reseeded incredibly densely to saplings that are now 13 years old, so they're two inches and they, you may want to consider brushing out one loop of the trail so that you have open access for um, navigating that trail system. That is included in the trail recommendation. The third one is the um, designation of reserve. If you look at the map in the southwest corner, there's a really special hemlock hardwood grove and it includes a part of a, um, the, oak, the oak forest and north of the wetland complex is this wonderfully naturally seed in maturing white pine grove that wasn't cut last time it's it's dense it's overstocked but it's pretty special i would put that in the reserve i wouldn't touch that and uh along the old cricket hill extension on the eastern edge there's another section of the hemlock hardwood that it surrounds and kind of embraces this really neat spring seep drainage zone that was not entered last time I would include that in the, the reserve. That's that's a pretty special niche. So that's your third recommendation. The fourth is the um, the concept we've already addressed of BMPs. I might add 4A, and then 4B would be again recommending that tra the um, forest stewardship committee or group somehow have a mechanism in town to take on care of these woods and the community decision process that will be necessary in the future if through adaptive management, you decide it's necessary to do a harvest insurance. Fifth one is again, the crop to release the conservative minimal harvest that would maybe really remove 15% of the stocking. It would retain 85% of what's there. So you are holding a lot of carbon in those residual trees, which will grow a little better. So that, that um, balance mathematics of withdrawal and reserve, I, I don't know how it would be met, but I do know 15% is a really light cut. It is not like what you're seeing in the Coles property, some of the other things that have gone on in town. That's your fifth recommendation for town farm. The sixth is you've got this oak hardwood stand that's, if I was going to talk like a timber heart, a timber manager, which my early training was, it's an unbelievably um, economically valuable stand. It's also an, an a wonderful ecological functioning stand. Oak is a really important species for habitat. It, it grows fast, it pulls a lot of carbon fast, and so it's not replacing itself. In the sapling class you've got black birch, white ash, black cherry, red maple, beech, a lot of beech, um, sugar maple, striped maple, and ironwood, but you have maybe less than one percent of red oak seedlings. One idea we had for up there would be to plant red oak saplings and seedlings through times so that you do not lose long term that component of the forest. Even if you leave the forest alone, the stacking of the other species beneath that oak crop now, those are what are going to dominate through time. So you may consider, do we want to keep oak up there? If so, we may need to do an intervention, do something human impact to shift that species composition in the undisturbed. That's our sixth recommendation. Seven Mary, is- May I interrupt? Yes, Susan? Okay. I was just wondering, with the, um, the if, you're, if you're interested in putting in the red oak, what is the procedure? Do you have to cut trees to do that? How, what does that involve? Okay, Thank if you. I was gonna plant red oak up there and it was on private owner's land, so, one person and I would make these decisions. I would go in, I'd pick areas where there's a natural opening, a tree fell down, a hemlock tree died, nothing grew but herbaceous plants thus far. And 
these, bear in mind, these trees are one to three inches, so they're small trees. I might take clippers, a, a saw, a hand saw, and I pick the area. First, you always look for natural openings to put the seedlings or saplings in. Um, because you don't want them overshadowed. Then you may plant one and take two or three, maybe a striped maple or a beech, something that will give more light to the tree you planted. You might put the protective plastic tubing around them so they're not eaten up by the moose and the deer that happily enjoy that mountain. So, and then you watch them, you, you go back, you visit them through time. You make a good map of where these are planted so that you can visit easily. If you do the brushing of the trails, you have easy access. Or even if you're just hiking, you have it documented somewhere so you know where to revisit. And you give them five years or so, if they make it over a certain height, above browse height, they could be a component of your future forest, if that answers your question. If you have anything to add, Alex, please chime in. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, people in, in, in forestry world, you know, it would be called like an enrichment planting where you would sort of, or an underplanting. Um, and, you know, the, the Green Mountain National Forest you know, our company planted 4,000 of these this spring, and it was in an undisturbed forest, and they're just plant, you know, oak is a tree that can, you know, it has an acorn, starts with an acorn, a lot of carbohydrate, it can, it can hang out in the understory for, I've been on a research project where they've been measuring six inch high oak seedlings for 26 years, and they're just hanging out in the understory, and the deer haven't eaten them, so they're, they're, they're relative, they can deal with a little bit of shade, so it, you know, you can plant them with very minimal disturbance under and get them to establish and be prepared for a moment of release, which is kind of how oak behaves in general in the forest. Any other questions on that one? So, um, no more? Okay, I'm going to move on. Number seven, practice seven is in the area where there was a red pine plantation that got disease, got pathogens, and it got clobbered by ice. I was actually involved in that last one. We took all the red pine out. Thousands of seedlings came in. Now they're saplings. There are a lot of them per acre. This is my bias towards my original training. We recommend maybe going in and cleaning and weeding much like you would your garden. And even at this age, they are, you can discern the superior genotype, the, the alpha tree, the tree that's gonna make it. And we maybe take two, one or two saplings on the south side of that sapling that you know is going to be a future crop tree, a future storage unit for carbon, and doing that weeding and thinning. That is, that is an interference that is, uh, the forest will do it on its own. I, I have a will. quick question on that. Can I yeah. ask one? Yes, um, go ahead, Janet. So the red pine was from the, is not natural here, right? This is part of the old plantations from the... Correct, they were planted. So why would we, if we want the health of the natural forest, um, why would we continue, you know, thin and pamper and ha have more red pine for the future? I, very few of those seedlings are red pine. Where oh. there is red pine seedling is on the edges, where there was some residual remnants of the plantation that are more a component of the white pine hardwood grove to the east, to the western edge. The seedlings that are in the, the main area are sugar maple, red maple, black birch is 60% of it. Um, okay. okay. Paper so birch, pin cherry. So no, red pine isn't there. And again, this kind of weeding, we've heard a lot of talk from the community, let nature do its thing. Nature will do its thing. Eventually those trees that are genetically superior, they're going to dominate that stand down the road. So uh, practice seven, we recommend it as foresters looking at, this is an option you may choose. Um, practice eight was the carbon issue that we've talked about in the other. Practice nine was the educational where you perhaps, perhaps seek some grants for signage. It might be um, interesting to have a sign that denotes some of the historic and cultural attributes of the site, the Maynard Cemetery, the Bates Cellar Hole, there's two really interesting, um, they were, I was told that they were stock pens, stock corrals that were built when the land was used as a town farm for containing the livestock. And you may have a sign that just tells people about that. You may have a sign next to that wetland complex that many people use for birding already. And you could maybe have a sign that lets people know, welcome to the Conway 
town farm property. This is the uses we'd like you to engage in here. And these are the ones you wouldn't. Um, again, doing maybe community walks for inter inter nature interpretation. So that's practice nine. Practice 10 was the boundary issue. Um, town farm also has a, a well delineated perimeter Coles is marked and painted and signed. DCR is marked and painted and signed. You've got a private property, little section in the Northwest, but you have fiscal evidence there. So the signage would be more to welcome people and to tell people, hunters, that they're on your land, snowmobilers, they're on your land. It's not essential because the boundaries are kind of clear there. 11, 11 I, I personally would like to see there, you've got this road that is still on your town books. It's access to that cemetery. My understanding from um, communication with the highway department is it's still on the books and should be maintained so that families have access to that cemetery. You share this road with Coles Lumber, DCR, there's a couple of private people up there, the Peterson family. And so everybody's using that road to go in to do whatever they're doing up there. The culverts were sized a century ago. They're undersized for the current extreme weather. You may form some kind of collaboration. This will be an activity for your forest stewardship committee to work with your neighbors to maybe install properly sized culverts, put gravel and stone where you might need it to make the road surface better or even fine gravel so that your drainage is attended to, just to upkeep those roads so that if you do do silviculture down the road, you can perhaps access the site with a, a triaxle log truck and not have to rely on pulling it all down to where it's been traditionally landed the last 20 years down near Cricket Hill. And it would be an effort that you maybe your 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 for stewardship committee spearhead seek input for sharing the burden of the cost because everyone's using that road to access may the road. I, may I interrupt, Mary? Correct. Yes, please. This is you're speaking, one of the roads you're speaking about is Johnny Bean Road. Correct. Because I remember many decades ago taking a vote to take it off the, um, I owned a thousand feet on that property and the town voted to remove um, maintenance of the road and I don't know if it was discontinued or if, I think it was discontinued not abandoned. Yeah discontinued but, not abandoned and what I was told is if people still want to access the cemetery that way, that they have the right to do that. So it may be wise to try to upkeep the road, not to a standard of, you know, a town road, but a way in. That's a lot of money. Who's, I mean, the water wa washes down. I, uh, and the road going to the cr original Cricket Hill is Beaver Pond now. Yep. I used to ride my horse over there. <laughs> yeah, when I started my career, I drove a half ton GMC all the way through, regularly. It was that open. <laughs> but um, it just seems to me that it is a way in, and it, it's still a pretty decent road. And I think, I, I know there's been a lot of, in in our outreach effort, a lot of people have had issue with way, the way the road has been maintained and used through the past. But when I walk it, I still see it serviceable. I do think some of the culverts may have um, trouble as the intensity of the rainstorms continue in the future with the climate changing. So okay, I'm in there as a way to assure access in. Then I, I, I would like to say just a, a something else then. Um, the town isn't maintaining it. I mean, if town voted not to maintain it, the amount of money that the town people are going to have to pay to maintain something like that is enormous. And getting into that area from both roads, there's a lot of steep area to get in, uh, downhills, uphills. Um, and the other thing is that um, the all wheel drive vehicles, four wheel drive vehicles, um, recreational vehicles have gone in there and have played havoc with the roads and I've seen them a number of times where they get stuck in the mud and so on and so forth. Is there anything to, I didn't see anything and maybe I missed it, but um, some guidelines about the kind of vehicles that can be taken in there? 
I mean, it, it's a totally different experience when a motor vehicles are in there. If somebody's out hiking or riding their horse and suddenly they have a vehicle to contend with. Do you want to chime in, Jack? Yeah, I, I'm just afraid that we've got a confusion here that there's Johnny Bean Brook, which I think is different from what we're talking about. That's a very steep area that's been totally wrecked by four wheelers going yeah. in and making a horrible mess of it. Right. And I think Mary's I think talking, talking about something about else, which I don't know of as Johnny Bean. I know it is, well, I don't know what the name is, but it, it Hill comes Hill in from Old Cricket Hill. Hill. Yeah. And, and I, so I think there's a confusion that we're talking about two different parts of the road. I, I agree. I think it's known locally as, is it Cricket Hill Road extension that goes to Maynard Cemetery? Because you're right, Johnny yeah. Bean goes further out and that has been somewhat. Well, it, go, it goes way down, um, towards down, Poland a, Road. down towards Poland Road and it's very steep yeah. ravine. And uh, it's, it's not something that should be open and maintained. And it certainly should not, not be vehicles traveling on it. Maybe horses, but not not vehicles. But the, the part that comes in from Old Cricket Hill it has already been graveled some and, and it's, it's fairly usable. It is. It and you want to keep it to be maintained. You keep it in fact, way. I mean, there is a some kind of a requirement that people be able to get to the cemetery. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm going to uh, I'm going to move us along right now and just keep keep going okay. here a little bit. Um, the, you know, we'll, we can talk more about the, the logistics, but I don't want to get too mired in the, in the details okay. right now. And that wraps up the recommendations for Town Farm. I think we can do the poll or, or answer questions now before the poll. I, I have a question again. Yes, if I may. Yeah, go okay, ahead. so I noticed, I mean, it, it seems like the value, the primary thing is again, um, really protecting the forest, however you define the word protecting. But I've noticed that you've got 50 acres reserved for um, crop and potential crop down the future, starting in five years. And what is it, 24 acres for reserve? And that doesn't seem to keep the, the amount of acreage, um, the, the value of the acreage is greater for the crop as opposed to the reserve. And I would like to swap them so that the reserve is the primary portion of that and the crop is the smaller portion. I think that's more reflective of what people have been saying they'd like done with the woods. Um, yeah, in the in the plan we have it written, I think as as twenty to forty acres of each thing, and so you know that that's totally part of our discussion tonight. So that definitely duly noted. Well, I I think I might add the, the participants here this evening. I agree. You're saying more reserve. If you take the survey and what there was ninety respondents and the people who were at the Zoom one. I would say that ratio may be equal or more biased towards active silviculture. So maybe the solution that we could agree on for inclusion is that same language of contingency to study it, see if there's a compelling reason to do any kind of active silviculture on town farm, if it promotes and enhances for its resiliency and you can validate its um, execution is necessary for sustainability of the forest as a carbon sink. Is, is that something we may agree on? I just wanted to address other voices that we have heard in the process, Susan, not to invalidate or in any way disrespect your um, recommendation for moving ahead. Uh, so uh, it sounds to me like Susan was raising a different issue though. And, and I will say that when you presented this plan to the select board for the Fournier property, we, we said basically what Susan just said was it looked like the, the amount of land that was held in reserve was smaller than we would hope. And I was thrilled to see that you dramatically increased the amount of land on your maps that were in the reserve area. And 
and um, you know, I, but and then and, and it it didn't. Perhaps you didn't do that for the for the, the Cricket Hill land. Uh, I, I, we we did it. I don't remember that coming up, but it's coming up now. So now is the time yeah, to yeah. continue so, our discussion. But but I but I completely agree with this Susan that there is a real difference between saying this is land that we consider reserved, and when you went through your talk, you, you identified real specific reasons of why there were certain characteristics in the Fournier property that made it really eligible for a reserve. There were, uh, you know, uh, you, you just know the properties very well now. And you said, there's this wonderful place and this wonderful place, and they deserve to be protected. And I don't know what the wonderful places are for the Cricket Hill area, and perhaps Susan does, because she does it very well. But it, it sounded like that, that, that that at least a 30, you know, a 50-50 splitter, you know, you said there's 20 to 40 for each or something. Uh, it, yeah, it's very, it's very hard to show uh, a range in a amoeba-shaped blob on a map. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's, when you guys at the select board said, whoa, 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 they, this looks not like what we're talking about, and we changed the map, and it you, obviously you did. works, because now you say, oh, that's exactly what I'm thinking. <laughs> you know, we, we can't... Uh, you know, I guess the 50 acre number is obviously a big number, but it's also a exceptionally light practice distributed across those acres. And so it's, you know, if you were talking about intensity of practice, making a forest reserve is an exceptionally intense decision because you are completely not doing anything there. So it's but that's like, what uh, people are looking for. Exactly, exactly. But I, I'm, I'm also just saying that that, you know, 40 acres of untouched reserve balanced with 50 acres where you did a 10 to 15% removal, you know, there's still a heavy emphasis toward not doing anything, which I think is what I'm hearing from everybody anyway. So that, that yeah. seems okay to me. Um, so is it, um, okay. So could we agree to include that conditionality and optionality of an active civil cultural project with the caveat that we increase the reserve area and maybe we can explore i know there are spring seeps through the area that we had recommended for cutting and those areas could certainly be pulled out with the conditionality that we increase the preserve proforestation acreage is that something we could form a consent something everyone here tonight could live with and again it would be included as an optional project optional recommendation based on future consensus future review by a force stewardship committee and having substantiated reasoning um, that is connected to forest resilience and carbon sequestration for executing it on all so it wouldn't be one of the hard fast ones we put in to be implemented through the next 10 years is that something we could agree at and that we increase that reserve acreage Any additional comments? Are we are we ready for a poll? We're ready for the poll. I, I think so. The poll will certainly answer it. Yeah. Well, I, I would just like to just say very quickly, Mary, um, I'm having trouble taking it all in without being able to read it. And I hear all the words and I can't really say I can agree or not agree because I'm not I'm not able to absorb it without okay. seeing it in front of me in writing. Thank you. And, and one thing we were going to mention at the end is our comment period. We're still trying to figure out a mechanism, whether we do it with email or we open a Google Drive link where you can submit revisions, edits, comments, and feedback up till what did we decide, Alex? September 10th. September 4th. So that then we would form the final draft after we hear all of your feedback because we know it it became this colossal plan trying to include everybody's input and everybody's caring and love for these woods and i think it's larger than my usual plans but it was the only way to complete it and honor the process that we gave our word we were going to exercise when we started <laughs> so i i think is will that give you a little comfort susan around the ability to have further say Okay, can you unmute? I can't hear you. But I, I see a head shaking, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. 
Do the poll, Alex. Make sure you scroll all the way down. <laughs> I love the poll. Cool, cool. Right. Okay. It's um, it's it's pretty amazing that there is nothing here that's getting a one out of ten. So that's good. That is good. That is good. Um. Uh, so we got the crop tree. The weeding isn't bad. I mean, that's not bad. Sixty percent. So people, uh, we did a good job of educating you about the why of that. Um. Okay. So to recap, I think we can safely include as a SFP in your finished plan, invasive control, trail maintenance and mapping, um, forest reserve, um, planting the red oak, I like that. Cleaning and weeding, I think that, could we agree that that could be one of the optional practices put at the end of the plan that would be open to review, comment and consensus forming mechanism in the future when brought up by your forest stewardship committee. Um, and the others, we could include carbon, educational outreach projects, boundaries, and some form of collaboration over protection of the road services as they, the conditions that they are in now. Um, and Mary, and, if I can, if I can jump in on the boundary thing, one, you know, being, being the guy who is not uh, from Conway or nearby there, a thing that I heard a lot in the, in the different forums that we've had is just a little bit of overlap and conflating between state forest, town forest, you know, oh, there, we're walking up on Cricket Hill and there are this and that on the state forest and it's actually the town forest. And so I think a little bit of signage would be really helpful there just to say, hey, this is the town forest and we do things a little bit differently than the state forest or than the lumber company or the private citizen. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm personally excited to see that because I think it's something that is important there just to differentiate that hey this is a little bit different than the other parts of the world around us here okay and please um of, of the poll to me has clearly demonstrated what i can safely include as a appropriate for um sustainable forestry practice in the final plan and it also highlights um practices with concerns and objections from the group at this time and what I see highlighted is the silviculture, the harvest. Um, could we agree to include it with the caveats we mentioned in Fournier, with the concept that further review and comment will be coming through our Google link mechanism, and that it is introduced as optional based on review and compelling reasoning and logic that would dictate how such a operation would enhance force resilience and promote the use of the forest as a carbon um, sequestration and climate mitigation tool. Is that something we could tentatively agree on? And please, if further objections, say so. And one thing that I am committing to do before the close of our comment period is to take out the people into the woods to demonstrate what that cut would look like in the forest. I proposed that I would flag a little section, half an acre or something, so you would see the intensity of the harvest practice that we recommend. And that may help you to visualize the difference between business as usual in the hill towns and what we heard your town would like to see um, for the care and stewardship and silviculture harvesting in you, on your town forest in the future. So if that's helpful, I know I have to limit people per tour, but I would, I really am committed to doing that because I think it would help you see what we're talking about. So I will be emailing and trying to create that. <laughs> but if we can make some kind of agreement on what to include in your final storage plan, that would be wonderful. And this is your time to state your concerns and objections. We can see if we can create resolution. Jack, you want to go there? Are you, are, is he muted, Alex? Can you unmute him? Are, are, am there I you unmuted? You're on. Can I talk now? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I just, I know that there's some people who feel very strongly about not cutting. And so I wanted to make a very strong statement in the counter situation. 
if you use toilet paper and you are absolutely against cutting, then you are a hypocrite. Cutting is happening somewhere. And unfortunately, right now, it's happening in virgin forests in Canada, which are far more valuable ecologically than our little bit of forest, which is really very new. The land was all clear cut 100 years ago. This is, this is new forest. It isn't really old forest at all. And it's NIMBY. It's, it's not in my backyard, I think is really an outrageous perspective. I mean, if we're going to use wood products, if you live in a house and not in a tent, then your house is built of wood, the cutting has to happen somewhere. And it, you, you've got to look at the possible different places it could happen in. And yes, we should be preserving forests. We should be converting some of our forests in a three or 500 year plan to real ancient forests. But is most of the forest in Conway the ideal forest for that? Or is there forest in much more wild areas that is more important to protect and right now is not being protected? Thank you. So that's my bet. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Mary McClinton. Um, thanks, Jack. Um, if we were living in a vacuum, then I would agree with you. We're not living in a vacuum. We are living in an area surrounded by privately owned forests that are being heavily logged. And I think the landscape perspective of um, that I, and I, my, my, my sense is that, and this isn't a complete, I think this, I've been corrected that this may not be completely accurate, but my sense is that pro a lot of private landowners feel um, partly, you know, they've used, they do a chapter 61 um, designation to save on taxes. They get a forest management plan. Pretty often that includes some kind of logging um, that they, and they have the pressure of perhaps economic pressure or other reasons why um, it would make sense for them to log their property. And that's happening all around surrounding each of these town forests. And so my sense is that, um, that leaving a good solid amount of these town forests to evolve over time and see what happens to them let them, you know, and not be doing, not do a lot of silviculture um, is not hypocritical in that, um, you know, we don't want anybody to be doing it anywhere, but it's because the town is, owns this property, it's a unique opportunity for the community to let the woods stay the way they are, um, will stay, let the woods have less, less human intervention, I would say, and see how they evolve and that that's not Coles is not doing that um, a lot of private landowners are not doing that um, and um, so so i it's i i disagree with the nimby aspect of it i think of it as a more of the lands recognition of the landscape and the difference between a town owned property and a privately owned property or a state owned you know then the state has their whole um, perspective too. Susan, thank you, Mary. Um, oh, go ahead, Susan. All uh, right. Okay. okay, thanks, Janet. Um, I just wanted to say so everybody can rush right down there that Greenfield's um, co op in Greenfield has toilet paper <laughs> from bamboo. Right on. That's what we ought to be using, right? No, seriously, I'm serious. Toilet paper serious. made from bamboo. That is our future. Okay. Nobody's oh. laughing. With <laughs> my, my, my just two cents, can I? Uh, 
ahead, I chime in. I appreciate it in, 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 in the plan and in all the work that you've done, some focus on the health of the forest in different sections. And um, a, a big concern, I think, for all of us is, is habitat preservation. And I see some of the silviculture or, or the option for that that we that I hope you all consider is that you know some trees get healthier when they have more space and more room and that, that the different species um, provide important different habitats. So you could you know, maybe we can do some tests or maybe I'm sure the foresters, Mary, has some experience with, um, you know, the increased number of birds that use certain trees that are larger. And if you've got the old natural forest, often it takes a long time for some of them to get large enough to be uh, more useful for the different species. So I think that's an important component that that we should keep looking at in the future. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Objections, concerns? So I, 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 I'll just pipe in and to say that I, I appreciate the general trend towards flexibility in our recent uh, amendments. Um, and you know, and it, especially as applies to something ver like the leave it alone versus, uh, uh, you know, harvest timber. Uh, because I, I, I think um, fr from a carbon sequestration point of view, from the point of view of getting involved in the carbon credit market, there's going to be um, specific recommendations for forest management that arise out of that uh, out of our establishing something like that and that the, those those recommendations I would like to be in a position to follow to increase the value of the resource in that respect so um, uh, you know a, a lot of these debates I think are going to just be cleared up by data and recommendations towards solutions that we're all going to agree on in the future and that flexibility is the best bet for now. So the optionality. Yeah. Um, can I add something? I, I do want to say, Phil, that we added that section on carbon. We added a brief summary on what the the four science is telling us now about carbon. I agree with Priscilla. There's a lot of literature coming out. There's almost two polar opposite camps of how to do it, but People who are who subscribe to active forest management, they are saying cut light, long periods between disturbance, grow the mold, keep keep dense, um, well stacked stands. Our recommendations are in sync with the current science field. So even if you add it as an optional um, practice, and your your forest stewardship community reviews it in the future, and you're going to exercise it, how this is written is um, actually might be even lighter than, is, I'd be really interested to see what uh, Mass Audubon and NEF come up with for, and TNC, Nature Conservancy, come up with for suggested forestry practices. I've read a lot of stuff, listened to a lot of people, done my homework, and the idea to play in the carbon game, you have, you have these two paths, what they call business as usual, how forestry is done in the Commonwealth, business as usual, what everybody's doing. And then in order to sell credit, in order to play in that game and make money, you have to demonstrate that what you are doing is creating additionality. What you are doing is above and beyond business as usual. You are managing your forest in an exemplary fashion, that is retaining high stocking, growing older trees, having the introduction of some young forest, but you're doing it differently than most people are and the way they assess the tonnage of the metric ton of carbon that they then um equate to what is it carbon equivalent credits is the difference between the growth in your forest done in this exemplary above and beyond fashion 
and the growth in a forest that was done business as usual. And if you can remember your calculus, there'd be a curve for your growth done in this high standard way, a curve for growth business as usual. And the carbon that they will value and sell on the market is that space between the additionality, the carbon that you're storing that is above and beyond what business as usual in the Commonwealth stores in a forest that's caught in a customary fashion. So I can assure you, if you do the practices as we describe them, your additionality is going to put you in that game. It really would. I can't see, unless that the, they're going to come up with new studies before that whole Williamstown thing is done, I'd say you would be in that process. You'd be able to participate and demonstrate additionality. And you'd have that area under the curve of what you propose to do, what's being done on coals, what's being done in a lot of areas, business as usual, if that assures you at all. But I do agree, the optionality approach that we sort of have a consent about, of, it sounds like most of you could live with it if it's an optional practice that merits review and is contingent upon logical reasoning for its execution. Is that a good summary of what I've been hearing? I think so. Awesome. Do we do it? I think, I think we're kind of there. Um, Any other comments? You have us. This is your time. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming and reading and showing up for this whole process. I've learned a tremendous amount about community-based forestry. I've learned about how when, when a public constituency owns a forest, you can't just decide. I can't just go in and see it like I see it as an individual timber, train conventionally as a timber producer and make the call. And I thank you for helping me grow as a professional. Mary, one more short comment. So, okay. so um, the name that I keep hearing, and I know you know this guy, is a guy named Bill Muma. And, Muma. and his research is the research that Priscilla is talking about that says it's the oldest trees that preserve the most carbon. Now that doesn't mean the old dead trees, like Joe said, but the, the, the oldest trees, the biggest trees, preserve the most carbon, even though a lot of people didn't used to believe that. And what I can tell you is that I'm also on our conservation Commission. I go to the Conservation Commission annual meetings, and Bill Muma was a last minute entry into the speeches that occurred at the end of the day when most people leave, and his talk was standing room only among all of the mm -hmm. Conservation Commissioners in the state. I couldn't believe it. Uh, you know, the, uh, I, the, that you could not get into the room when Bill Muma was speaking at the end of the day. I, so. I, I've actually gone to three of his talks now. The last one I went to was in the winter, right before COVID hit, up in North Adams at um, Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. And he was on the agenda to speak with a representative of New England Forestry Foundation who's working on this carbon program for the Commonwealth right now. And Mr. Le Lewinsky talked about forestry and silviculture and why you can do that and grow carbon. And then Mr. Muma spoke and the questioning was great. He defended his position. He did say at the end of the speech, I am not opposed to silviculture and timber harvesting. I'm opposed to some of the forestry practices that are going on now and the extent and level of cutting that is witnessing, specifically in the biomass market. So that isn't don't cut at all. And this is Muma's own words. It was recorded, it's out there in the archive. And so, I mean, people bring him up all the time, but he isn't against uh, cutting. He, he really isn't. It, it, that is not his position. And I could uh, and I could say, and this is, yeah, I work in the timber industry, but <laughs> was he not speaking to the choir, right? Preaching to the choir at the CONCON convention? I, I mean, are you not a group of people that are like-minded? You, you know what I mean? That would have definitely stood up and showed up at standing room only for the message that he had to relay because it syncs with that protection of all filter strips in the riparian zones that are crucial to the mandate that you have as a CONCON member. But I think he's one voice in the science literature. I think I can send you lots of other literature that um, also speak about silviculture being acceptable in the standard 
that is above business as usual. You're talking about just a whole different perspective. It's light, it's conservative, it's keeping good stocking when you're done, it's making that room for young forests, but it's doing it in a way that respects what the older age class is doing for carbon in the woods, and it's necessary. So that's what I have to say. And this is my first time I've put a personal opinion into this whole process. I'm tired, I'm sorry. <laughs> But I, I like Bill Wilma. It, it was great that night because he really let everyone challenge him and he was able to explain his full thinking. So I appreciated that. But any more concerns and objections or questions? Susan? So I just, wanna, I just wanna say first to Mary, I am right there. I think that there's an intelligence in the woods that is far beyond human comprehension and we need to let the trees do their thing and we might be quite surprised if we live long enough for their slower evolution um, but I really want to know how do we move into what do I do where do we go to create some kind of guidelines for about the vehicles that can go in there because there truly I don't know what's going on now but um, well, the roads are in pretty solid shape. We were up there, what, April, May, Alex? I think for you that the BMP, having a committee in town that takes on the care in the stewardship and really shows up for accountability would be helpful. I really think that. And to address the, the wonder and power of the forest, sometimes I think, like, you know, I've been watching this game 40 years and I see what's regenerating, I see what's growing. I do think there's a, a natural intelligence to the forest that it knows it's getting warmer. The forest knows. Maybe it's way ahead of us and how what to do. You know, maybe all these studies and all these practices are going to come up with. Maybe the natural ecosystem is already on this case, and we're just in the way. But that's I didn't say that. Strike it from the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm sorry. Part of what I what you said I couldn't hear. But did you address the vehicles? I think a way for you to look at that might be your BMPs, your collaboration with your neighbors, because it is a commonly used road, and the establishment and codification of a forestry committee in some way that looks at and holds that protective um, accountability in the future. I think that one might be the only way to do it, uh, but please, other comments, throw them out so, there. So there, it, it, it's, it's town property, the you have um if you want the police to enforce you want the police to enforce rules like that you enact a bylaw um and we have we have very few bylaws in town that deal with personal behavior uh of any kind and um the a bylaw would require a two-thirds vote at town meeting and you spell out what you want you spell out how you how it gets enforced um you you write it up you get 10 signatures and it gets put on the ballot and that's how that's how you get rules made for public property in town that are enforceable but that's that's a thing you're regulating pri private conduct personal conduct that's a thing so there's going to be people that object <laughs> but thank you phil sure any more comments, questions, objections? I think we have a plan. I think, Alex, I feel like ready to complete these plans. And please um, use that Google link and send us more feedback or comments for revisions and edits so that we can complete the plans for you within the um, grant period. Yeah. Great, well, well thank you everybody um, and Thank, Thank you for you. going uh, going quite yeah, a bit longer. But in there with us. Well. We've so, taken your whole evening. Yeah, have a uh, have a good evening, and we'll we'll be in touch as we wrap things up here.